Shall I intro? You want to do it? You gonna you gonna go for a biakisha? No, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I'm here with my main man, <laughs> Alan Turing. <laughs> Respect. No. <laughs> You're not gonna do a sort of Richard Madeley. <laughs> no, let's have some dignity. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Diminishing Returns. Uh, just your two regular guys here today. Uh, that's me, Alan, and over there is Sol. Hello. Not going for the Boyaka shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was biting my tongue. <laughs> I was like, which one to break out? Respect. You know what, Alan? I must say, rewatching this film, I was really upset because I realised how many little affectations I have that are based on seeing this film when I was like 11. (laughs) I don't know how many have come out on this podcast, but for example, um, I can't hear or say the phrase West Side without going, West Side! (laughs) Which is like, it's not exactly a quote, but. That was definitely when I heard when I watched the film again. It was like, oh yeah, West Side is the best. East Side, yeah, okay. Yeah. East Side is the best. West Side is the best. East Side is the best. West Side is the best. West Side is the best. East Side is the best. <laughs> Shit, I mean, West Side is the best. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we we are of course talking about Ali G today. So, d- w- more specifically, we're kind of doing a loose double bill here uh, today uh, and next week. We jokingly, like it well and truly, was just like, "Ha, huh, that'd be ridiculous." On a diminisode, we joked about doing Sasha Baron Cohen season. Yeah, that diminisode episode, I believe, is titled Sasha Baron Cohen season. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should do Borat or something. Come on, as if we're not going to do allergy in the house. <laughs> it should be our next season. <laughs> the Sasha Baron, the Sasha Baron Cohen, Cohen season. season. <laughs> Everything allergy in the house to Borat to Grimsby. <laughs> oh, I haven't seen Grimsby. <laughs> Neither have I. Oh, I'm very tempted though. And it was a joke, but I I also think Borat is quite an interesting film to talk about. And so yeah. basically what happened was I went, fuck it. I feel like rewatching that film. I haven't seen it in, you know, God knows how many years. I want to see if it holds up. Yeah. And then it was this whole conversation of, well, if we do that, we've got to do, you know, the the, the entire that Ali G show roster, which would entail getting into Sasha Baron Cohen's entire career. And it was like, oh, that's going to take, that'd be far more than one episode of reasonable length. We'll have to do it across two. And we yeah. thought about doing it as a trilogy, but... I There's not that enough, much enough material. material. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, basically we... what you've got is, you know, there's Borat and Bruno are, are very much, you know, the same thing. Yeah. And then there's sort of the other side of Sasha Baron Cohen, which is, you know, scripted. And, you know, the, I, I think there's a lot to get into with the history of his career, kind of how he came up through yeah. the comedy scene. So... Yeah, so just to just to sort of uh, framework this a little bit, today we're going to be talking about Ali G in the house, specifically as in the film we're really looking at in detail, but we're going to look at Ali G and as a character in general. We're going to really consciously limit how much we talk about the other characters. Um, I'm sure, I'm yeah. sure we will be talking about Borat a bit, but we're going to make a bit of an effort to not get into that too much, we'll because deal with that's that going to be week. next week. Yeah, but we will touch upon this week his other scripted straight acting not straight acting but comedy acting stuff um the dictator uh and grimsby i guess are the two main ones where he's the the lead and it's you know it's built around him and then next week we will do bruno uh alongside borat and sort of mop up with what he's done recently with um, who is america who is america yeah. yeah okay so yeah, I think this is going to be a really interesting episode for our uh, American listeners, <laughs> because I, I listen to a lot of, which I don't listen to many pop culture podcasts, but the ones I do listen to do have a real thing for Ali G, because obviously he ultimately went over to HBO and was this kind of yeah. cult thing on American television, but I don't think any of them quite understand what they got fully do you know what i mean when you hear them talking about it i don't think they really know what the deal is so 
Americans, you're, you're going to hopefully love hearing about how uh, the rights between seasons of the show all break down and that sort of <laughs> tedious bullshit. I'll take you right back there, Sol. I, I assume you're a bit too young, but I I watched the 11 o'clock show. I was 13, oh, wow. 14. It was perfect for me. You know, it was right aimed at my age group. <laughs> like young. So to me, the 11 o'clock show is this mythical breeding ground for... <laughs> like the cream of british comedy talent that <laughs> i i never really watched ian lee <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> uh, um it's like how everyone at pixar came from the simpsons you know it, it's just it's it's baffling how much talent they kind of discovered and and i we should say for people because you know i think a lot of our listeners are certainly younger than us and i barely know what the 11 o'clock show is um it was just a kind of topical magazine show wasn't it but like comedic and quite yeah. punk rock in its sense a little bit anarchic a bit... yeah but classic channel 4 stuff really and this really was as far as i know just like yeah we'll do a bit of you know a bit of a sketch that'll fill three minutes and then we'll do like a little animated thing for 30 seconds and then we'll just have a monologue to camera about the news and they did i think they did deal with topical things oh god i honestly i watched I say I watched an episode on YouTube last night. I actually, you know, skimmed through it, but it was like being back in my childhood. It was unreal. Every every single thing they talk about, you know, Princess Diana, uh, Mad Cow Disease, <laughs> Spice Girls. <laughs> well, Gary Glitter turned out to be the only man in the computer shop with his web pages stuck together. <laughs> Jerry Halliwell's gone blonde and lost her ginger twat, and Vanessa's lost 13 stones. That'll be her husband leaving her. <laughs> Cliff Richard has gone into the charts with Millennium Prayer. Now, that's the words of the Lord's Prayer set to the tune of Old Lang Syne. Now, I'll go over that one more time. Words he didn't write set to music he didn't write. It could only be improved if it was a song that he didn't bloody sing. <laughs> Tony Blair's... You're scary. <laughs> In a nice way. Every joke was like the most 90s stuff you could possibly imagine. It, it was unreal. You're saying uh, Breeding Ground there. Obviously, Ali G came from that um, as a pre-recorded segment on the show. And he is not even, I would argue, not even the biggest deal to come out of this <laughs> show. Well, the other person who was, well, the first time I ever saw him on TV, it was Ricky Gervais. He is the big standout. Yeah, him and Sasha Baron Cohen are the two big standouts. But it goes beyond that. You know, it's not just Ricky Gervais. It's Ricky Gervais and Steve Merchant. I... Well, I've got a feeling I saw Mackenzie Crook on that show yes, for the first yes, time. Yes, yes, yes. Now, strangely enough, mirrors are also often found at the scene. So, we advise you never to use a mirror again. Get your mum to comb your hair and tell you what you look like. I do. And she says I look lovely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he. You, you are absolutely correct. He is one of the people who the show kind of, I think, discovered pretty much. On on that note, Jimmy Carr appeared a few times. I'm assuming doing a bit of stand up. Ben Miller appeared a few times, um, yeah. doing a bit of comedy stuff. Robert Popper, our mate, we've spoken about him before. Yeah, Rich Hall. He oh, yeah. he was, I think, something of an underground comedian before the show, but yeah. he was on it and he wrote on it. You know, uh, Dom Jolly who went uh -huh. on to do Trigger Happy TV. I yeah. think he was basically doing Trigger Happy TV here, maybe a bit more interview focused but yeah dom jolly probably means nothing to anyone who's not a british listener but he had a show called trigger happy tv which was a really good actually bit of hidden camera prank stuff probably a solid case for the best hidden camera prank show of all time because most of those shows it's like one or two things that they spend 20 minutes prepping and then they do a big prank and then it's all over whereas trigger happy tv is just prank 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 yeah non-stop Rubbish! Yeah, total rubbish! Yeah, ciao! In fact, when I was watching the Ali G clips, I was putting it into a context of, yeah, Trigger Happy TV, Dennis Penis. You know, it seemed to be a yes. bit of a thing that was going on at the time of, you know, messing about with the public or celebrities and... and, and yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. 
I mean, Brass. When was Brass Eye? When did Brass Eye do all their stuff in terms of getting celebrities to say stupid stuff? Ninety seven Brass Eye, the series started. But yeah, that was something that happened on Brass Eye, in, in which they, you know, they kind of got mm. celebrities to give a PSA about a fake drug, and, and when they were, what they were actually saying was really stupid. They all fall on it like crazed animals, scoff the lot, and then lie around waiting for a DJ to play music which sounds like this. <coughs> Now, to the speeded up brain of a user, that sound lasts for four hours and sounds like this. I, I'm going to go back to the talent that the 11 o'clock show um, cultivated, but just on what you've said there, it really bothers me that, as far as I know, there isn't a word for this genre of. Because <laughs> it isn't hidden camera stuff. It's like, it's kind of prank show stuff but I don't know I feel like there needs to be a solid name and I can't believe there isn't one for the genre of this guy is an actor winding everyone up and they know they're being filmed but they don't know it's all an act you know yeah. the, the stuff that Sasha Baron Cohen does Nathan for you um, if you've ever watched that does it Windy City Heat which is a film I, I love which I keep going on about at the moment uh, does it and as you say Brass Eye it's hard to find examples of it because you can't just look up a wikipedia page for that <laughs> genre so i think yeah. really alan i think our main aim over the course of this and next week's episode should be to come up with a name for this genre of comedy <laughs> okay <laughs> anyway um the 11 o'clock show i mean god we're, we're not done yet simon blackwell who's that he is one of the two uh peep show writers oh right yeah yeah three yeah, yeah. There's three of them, aren't there? I forget which one. There's two main ones, and then one who pops in every now and then for an episode. Um, Robin Ince, yeah, one of Ricky Gervais's mates. That's probably what he's best known for now. But you know, a solid <laughs> comedian in his own right. Well, I've got a powerhouse for you here, Tony Way. Tony Way. <laughs> Tony Way was a writer on the show. I don't yeah, know if you yeah. know that, Alan. As well as uh, I assume appearing in it. Uh, we've spoken about Tony Way in multiple episodes of this podcast. So, of course. Um, I would point you in their direction, but I can't for the life of me think when he would have come <laughs> up in the past. He's come up a weird amount of times. Yeah. Much like he does just in films in general. Yeah. Uh, Will Smith. Not the Will Smith, but the fairly well-respected British comedian Will Smith. Yeah. He writes for the thick of it and things like that. V. Yeah, yeah. James Bobin, who I... Uh, this is a director... And I think, as far as I can tell, he specifically directed the Ali G segments. Okay. Because he went on to be the series director for all of the Ali G show stuff, as far as I can tell. And he's now a pretty big deal director in his own right. He directed the Muppets uh, Jason Siegel movie. He directed the Muppets Most Wanted sequel to that. He directed Flight of the Concords, the... Uh, oh. HBO series. I reading between the lines, I think he might have been I think he basically got into HBO off the back of Ali G and then Brock America. kind of got Flight of the Concords into HBO through his HBO credentials. That's kind of what I'm guessing happened there. He's currently making the remake of Clue or Cluedo. Oh yeah. Which uh, is interesting. And um the real powerhouse I haven't mentioned yet, who did start on this show, although I'm sure he'd done a lot of writing for newspapers and magazines and things leading up to this, but it was his first TV gig, Charlie Brooker. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Obviously, you know, he is a camera in front of the camera guy, but he's much more of a writer than a presenter. And I, I don't think he did any presenting on this. I think he was just writing. But that makes perfect sense, you know, topical stuff. That, yeah, it's, yeah. It's all in his wheelhouse, isn't it? Yeah. But but I think really, you know, I think it was a real school of comedy. You know, you get these little waves of comedians who come up every few years. And I just think this is a really fascinating, often somewhat overlooked one here. Well, that's it. I mean, just for anyone who doesn't know, I think it went out on a Thursday night at 11 o'clock. It was, uh, but it was kind of like dealt with whatever happened that week. So, so it was thrown together that week. And so that's why they had loads of writers and performers, because it was just like, okay, you go and do a four minute segment for us. You you, you write the presenter script for this. And, and it it's, so it, it has that kind of raw feel about it. And, and, you know, stuff like that happens all the time. That's nothing particularly groundbreaking. But yeah, it's like you say, there is kind of these occasional moments where it kind of coalesces a lot of new people. Maybe maybe they deliberately focus on, oh, let's bring some young talent 
um, mm. through or rather than like just going to the old faces. So to sort of focus in on Ali G a bit. Um, Ali G was the breakout breakout success story from the 11 o'clock show. And it was um, a pre-recorded segment. Uh, they just sort of went, oh, and now we're going to go to our youth correspondent, Ali G, who's interviewing someone, cut to VT. Um, so do you know anything about Sasha Baron Cohen pre-11 o'clock show? I know he did a series of skits and things for the Paramount Comedy Channel, which I think is essentially the old UK equivalent of Comedy Central before I think it just got rebranded as Comedy Central at some point. So I, I think there was a time when Comedy Central in the UK was just doing this incredibly low budget comedy. And again, like I'm, I might be completely talking out of turn here, but I've got a feeling that that was where David Walliams and Matt Lucas came up as well with the likes of Mash and Peas, which is also where mm. Edgar Wright started. Um, which would make sense, actually, because I don't know if you know this, Alan, but Matt Lucas was a writer on that Ali G show. I did notice uh, his name in the credits, yes. But yeah, uh, so I think he was just this sort of comedy guy doing weird little skits for little digital channels, managed to get a mainstream platform on Channel 4 in the era when Channel 4 was all about finding these, you know... <laughs> alternative comedy voices i mean god this this era of channel four was also you know as you say christopher morris left the bbc to go and do some channel four stuff adam and joe started out on channel four you know there, there was a whole wave of comedians beyond the 11 o'clock show who kind of were coming up around this era you know it was just your overnight success story is kind of how i remember it obviously i was very young but ali g was this complete sensation you know my 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 mum used to watch Ali G and laugh at it you know well that was it it's one of those things where even if you don't watch the source of it the, the actual show it became such a a, a part of culture uh, like you you kind of referenced earlier Richard Madeley off of Richard and Judy was parodying it, it like on mainstream TV. Although I think they'd moved to Channel 4 by that point, hadn't they? <laughs> now, finally, I was noticing that there is no sign of Richard. Is it OK if I, Ali, does the show with you today? Uh, what, looking like that? I'm afraid not. Is it because I is black? Oh. He full-on dressed up and did an impression of the character. Like, and, and then the problem is, you know, he... he, he it's like Austin Powers in the 90s where yeah. everyone was just doing impressions and it got <laughs> to the point where I think a lot of people's memory or understanding of the character is tainted by the cultural zeitgeist. This, this yeah. It's too a victim of its own success because, it, you know, I think the fact that we've decided to do two episodes on this probably <laughs> gives it away. But, you know, I'm a big fan of this stuff. I think it's really good <laughs> it, it does speak for a lot that you know uh, well ali g of course as a character depended on the people he was interviewing not knowing that it was a character that they believed in it and it became so successful that everyone knew it was even 80 year old politicians who he's interviewing would would know who he is because it was so mainstream this is exactly what i was talking about when i said i think americans might get something out of this episode because i hear a lot of oh, I don't like that first series and, you know, they didn't do enough um, pranking people and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, no, you don't get it. Like, Ali G was made to go out and, and prank people in the real world. But, you know, he was like one of the most famous faces <laughs> in the country. Without exaggerating, I think he was probably at a point, probably one of the most like top 10 recognizable yeah, yeah. Uh, TV personalities, certainly. Um and so you just, like you say, you couldn't begin to dupe anyone. So, although well, the I even know it's even very, yeah. In that, in the first series of um, the Ali G show, or that Ali G show, it, even before he went to America as such, it, it was still all the out, all the segments were filmed in America. Like, oh, the studio stuff where everyone kind of was in on it. Almost all. He already had to go to America by that point just to be able to do his job properly and then it was so successful channel four had to give him his own show a spin-off but at that point everyone knows who he is you can't do that anymore so mm. what they did was they gave ali g 
these kind of lengthy monologues and skits, which were the first real indication of Sacha Baron Cohen's uh, talent as a writer rather than a prankster. You know, they, they were sort of funny, but I think inarguably the weakest aspect of the show <laughs> by a mile. They would they would get a musician on uh, every episode to perform a song, and he'd kind of fuck it up with some like DJ jungle top of massive. it. I can't sleep Still I can't close my eyes. Yeah, whatever. I'm gonna add just a tiny bit of drum. I'll add just a little bit of sample. I get this. Just a little more. This one coming straight from out of the dancer. When the sun is shining, Just a bit of advice, you don't need that. Which, you know, is kind of a funny concept, but it was also like, oh, how can we kill three minutes? We'll kind of classify this as an <laughs> entertainment show. They would have a big celebrity guest on, uh, talk show style, who was obviously always in on it and knew who knew it was all a joke and just came on oh, for yeah. a laugh. His name is Mohammed Alvay. He got a big winky. Alvay. Alvay. He got a nice face. <laughs> I just want to go back to the actually what Ali G was originally, just because I think there will be some people who don't quite know, and I'd like to kind yeah. of get into it anyway. So what he did on the eleven o'clock show, his segments were they they cut to him and he would go like, "Yo, I was here with my main man," and he and he'd be interviewing someone, and it was generally uh, like an old politician, like people in their seventies and eighties who. And it's kind of, it was playing on the idea, and they'd obviously gone to these people and say, oh, it's like a youth, Channel 4 youth TV program, he's a presenter. Yeah. And they totally, from, from what it seems, certainly, they totally buy into this as a real character. And I think definitely in those early stuff, it plays as a real character. I think later on it gets a bit more exaggerated. The people in those sex segments, they don't come out looking particularly stupid, they just look yes. slightly out of touch and they're trying to do their best to communicate with someone who they have nothing in common with in, in quite a polite and friendly way. I think Ali G and Borat and Bruno, I think it is a real litmus test for, like, is this a nice person or not? Yes. <laughs> like, how nice is this person? Because it's amazing. You You can tell within, like, two seconds, more often than not, you can just make a snap judgment on someone's character. And... And I think it's far more extreme when dealing with Americans, for whatever reason. But certain people will really give Ali G and Borat out the time of day and sort of maybe won't... Maybe they'll take them to task on, on some of the uh, unpleasant things they might say. Yeah. I mean, that you know, the, that's kind of the point of the show, is to like really expose um, prejudice and... and yeah let people get people to let their guard down so they show their true self and then make a mockery of that but i think in the earlier stuff you're right i think a lot of the politicians and so on that come on the show come off quite well early on i i watched uh, a big compilation of all of the 11 o'clock show stuff last night mm -hmm. and you know a lot of them were kind of obviously getting annoyed with him but then there was this one guy who um was coming across really well and i thought wow this guy's being really taking the time to educate him and just not losing his temper with him was it tony ben um but i missed who who it was at the start it was tony ben and i, I remember <laughs> yeah. when he said like thanks to my main man tony ben i was like oh god it's tony ben of course, of course it's, it's tony, tony ben. ben yeah of course it is for real they there's girls in me estate or whatever they're 16 17 they already got one kid and they see something have... nice in the shops. And they think, Look, is me going to go and get a job? Or is me going to go and get welfare? Then me can sit on my batty and watch Vanessa or whatever. No, come on. You're no, not no, living no. in the real world, my friend. You're living in a world where everybody's just so bloody greedy right. that there's no hope of building a better society. And that's why we're in a mess. For real. <laughs> but similarly, like, James Lipton comes across so well 
in the American series. Yo, you out there, now listen to me. Just do like me and my bro, the MC. Think, my friends, consider, reflect, give mad props to the world. Translation, respect. Fresh. Yeah. You know, Buzz Aldrin comes across really well, yeah. to be honest. You know, obviously annoyed, but really polite and giving him the time of day. We know you've been axed this a zillion times. It must really get in your tits being axed it. But let's just sort it out. What do you say to all those conspiracy theorists who come up to you and say, does the moon really exist? I don't think there are very many people who question whether the moon exists. It what? exists. And all right, you just heard it here. It does exist. So all those people out there who are saying it don't, you was wrong. That's right. The moon does exist, and we went there. Yo, listen up. But how do they really know what is exists and what is the conspiracy things? Because I know I have seen a picture of J-Lo with two you know, massive geezer's dongs there, and apparently it weren't true. I haven't seen those pictures. Well, you should check them out. It's amazing. <laughs> okay. Certain people come across really well. But then on the flip side, um, other people, mostly uh, Republican <laughs> politicians. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think I think the, the worst one is arguably... Is it Andy... No, not Andy Rooney. What's his name? The guy who hosted 60 Minutes. So how does that spell Rooney? Are you any Y? Are you any? You've done this before? Yo, I mean, as many... Have you ever done this before? Yo, for real. I've done... I mean, I come many... What is your language, your basic language? English? Yo, for real. No. I so what language are you most comfortable in? Yo, English. For mm -hmm. real, I'm from England. Mm -hmm. And how shall I introduce you? So... Uh, that's your business, not mine. Yo. Look, I'm getting very close to the end of this. Yeah, I realize... Oh, for real. Yeah, go ahead. Do All what right. you have to do. Oh. Yo, check it. I is here with none other than my main man, Andy Rooney. Total respect. And today we is chatting about the media. He comes across appallingly. Because, you know, he's just, he's got no time for Ali G. Like, he knows he's an idiot, but he's, like, correcting his English and his language. Does you think the media has changed since you first got in it? Does you think the media has changed? Do you think the media has changed? Whatever. Does... No, it's English. The English language would say, do you think the media has changed? Not, does you think the media has changed? Yes, I think the media has changed. So what sort of things does you think the media should cover? Do you, do you think the media? Um, you know, do you think the media? I think it's an English-American thing, though, isn't it? No, 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 no. That's English. The English language is very clear. I have 50 books on the English language if you'd like to borrow one of them. I think he's the only person in the whole show that, like, calls him out on it when he says, is it because I is black? Yo, for real. Okay, so, I think that's about it. I, think, uh, I, I don't think we need any more. Can't do this. Can't do this. Yeah. Why not? Is no, it, uh, this is not. This is not going. I, I, is it because I, can't, I black? I can't waste my time. Hmm? Is it because I is black? You're black? For who's, real? Huh? Who's black? Your eyes. No, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't have time. Sorry. You've sorry. been rude to me from the first right, moment. Right. Right. I'm sorry. sorry. Trying to tell me I don't speak English. Well, right. Yo, it, it's been rude. That's quite racist, to be honest. Oh, racist. Racist. Yo. Racist. Yo. racist, not racial. Yo, racist. <laughs> He met Donald Trump um, and yeah. did a bit with him on the American show way before there was any inkling of him being president and all that. And again, it's like Donald Trump... I mean, I hate to say it, he doesn't come across that badly. He just comes across like a man who has no time for it whatsoever. Oh, he just wants to get away. He's, he's like, yeah, cannot be bothered with this at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and like, all things considered, he comes across quite well, really, compared to... <laughs> the sorts of people that are on the show usually but basically i was re-watching some of the earlier stuff the 11 o'clock show stuff and i haven't seen it for years i was pissing myself i was like sat on my own in my room laughing out loud and and uh, like that doesn't happen to me very often uh, so i was really enjoying it and then i watched yeah. some of the later stuff and gen basically the american stuff and it didn't have the same impact on me. I wasn't laughing. Really? As much. Yeah. I'm the exact opposite way around. I was trying to figure out why it is, really. And I, certainly the earlier stuff, 
it's like they've just tried to get in touch with whoever they can uh, who will agree to an interview and then they've had to work out what are they going to ask them what are they going to say i mean to be honest the earlier stuff feels like it doesn't feel a million miles away from something I could do, you know? I feel like if I went out with a camera and pretended to be an idiot with someone for for an hour, you could edit it down to something like that. Whereas, I think as the show goes on, and they obviously hone the craft, and you'll, you'll see as well, they, they full out, like, remake sequences that they did in the UK with American people and tr- sort of think, I'm going to try this again, but I'm going to do it a bit bigger. I'm going to say like the same sort of joke structure. Of, yeah. There's one where he's talking to etiquette coaches and he's sort of saying like, you know, this is Borat actually, but he's saying, you know, is it polite to talk about needing the bathroom? And they're like, no. And then it cuts to him at a dinner party going like, I need a shit and all that. And it's like, that's pretty much a scene for scene remake of a sequence he did in the mm. UK with a load of stuffy British people. What uh, subject do we talk about? Um, it's anything really. It depends who starts it. I mean, you could start off by, what would you say? Well, anything that comes into your head, really. Yes. Mmm. This is very nice. My wife, she is dead. <laughs> Why? Why? So Helen, please you tell me what you can talk about at dinner. Okay, what you want to think about is um, pleasant things. My wife is dead. Oh, I'm so sorry. Is it okay to talk about what I did last night? Yes, as long as you don't go into lots of details, whether it be... Yes. I don't know. Oh, yes, if you said, yes, I went to see a film last yes. night or... Last night I have a six. <laughs> yeah. Right, you, so I told you you shouldn't mention your, um, what you did last night. No, never mind. You said I can say what no, I did last night. Like, you can say you went to see a lovely time last night. But it was nice. Time. She was yeah. a lovely. Can I talk about what I did last night? Well, it depends on what you did last night. Is it something personal that maybe makes someone feel embarrassed or uncomfortable? No. Last night, uh, I hear the six. I beg your pardon? Mistake. I hear them with a woman from uh, Gambia. I do a... Oh. In America, we don't discuss that. But she was a nice high five. <laughs> <laughs> she was You're it. in trouble, George. <laughs> and um how do I say? Um I do not want to be what if I need to do a toilet? You just say oh just excuse me for a while. Please excuse me. Yes. I will go for a minute. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Certainly. Yes. Please excuse me, I certainly. Thank you. Okay. So would you like some more potatoes and peas? Because you haven't had any meat. Would you like some more? Oh, we have a pudding. Uh, I had a good sheet. But you didn't have any dog. You can't say that. What if I make a smell? Should I say it's me? No, you don't make it obvious. But if um, you feel like that maybe people are looking at you like, you, you just say, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. There is a smell. Like it it smells like a shit. Yes, <laughs> it does. I don't know, it just feels like everyone involved kind of honed their craft a bit as it went on. And also they get more comfortable going bigger with it. And I think maybe that's what you don't like. Yeah. But for me, I do like that. I, I, like I say, I, I just think, you know, again, to, to pull out an example with Borat the likes of Throw the Jew Down the Well, which is an, an infamous, infamous sequence mm. in the TV show where he, he goes into this bar, real redneck bar in Tucson, Arizona, and they introduce him as, oh, it's this, you know, it's this crazy foreign guy who's going to come up and do a song for open mic night. And he goes up with his guitar, dressed up like an American cowboy with, you know, a US flag clothing on, and he starts singing this song, In My Country There Is Problem, and he's going on about transport and the issues with transport. In my country there is problem And that problem is transport It takes very, very long 
because Kazakhstan is big. Throw transport down the well. Come on! So my country can be free. So my country can be free. We must make travel easy. Then we have a big party. And everyone's looking a bit like bored, but we'll, you know, we'll give this guy the time of day just to be polite because he obviously loves America. And if you like America, I guess we have to like you back. And then he s- moves into another verse. In my country, there is problem, and that problem is the Jew. And it, the the bar they lights pay up. Everybody, money. They never give it back. If you see the Jew coming, oh! you must be careful of his teeth. You must grab him by his money. What to do? Everybody, throw the Jew down the well. So my country can be free. You must grab him by his horns. Then we have a big party. It's one of the most perfectly crafted comedic sequences of all time, I think. It's also one of the most depressing bits of human interaction that ever captured on film and put out there. Uh, like, I think it truly counts as art. Yeah, I don't know. I, I just think there's more to that than I'm gonna talk to a politician and I'm gonna kind of talk about how I was boning the Julie and <laughs> kind of go, oh my dear, oh god, well, uh, okay. But that's it. I think in those early stuff, it, it, it does less of that. Uh, and it is more responsive to what they're saying. And there's there's kind of more of a realistic effort that this is a real kind of youth correspondent. That's fair, yeah. You know what? The early stuff is a lot more on the fly. I think as it goes on, it is much more of a sense of we have spent time in a writer's room yeah. planning responses. to our, like. So we're going to get to a point where we're trying to kind of direct people into a certain you know avenue or way of behaving especially later and with uh, and with borat and and bruno there's much more of a a feeling of entrapment where they know exactly who they're aiming for and what to say to inflame them absolutely what they will bite at what they won't i mean i'm not saying it's necessarily even better it just made me laugh more and also it's it's fair to say on that early stuff there is a laugh track i don't know if it's a laugh track real really it's yeah. the studio audience of the 11 o'clock show but then um once they spun off and made that ali g show and gave ali g his own show it retained the laugh track but oh but they, to be honest that never bothered me and perhaps it made me laugh more out loud just because it feels comfortable to laugh but for me i think i find it a lot i don't know i think i prefer it without the laugh track because in in uh, Ali G and Da US I, also known as seasons two and three of <laughs> that Ali G show, they drop the laugh track because it becomes yeah. an HBO production <laughs> and they don't go in for that shit. I'll, I'll echo the thought. I mean, part, what's what really set me off on this was Who Is America came out yeah. like two years ago, last year, something like that. And I watched it and I laughed so hard. I just completely forgot how funny I found Sasha Baron Cohen's early stuff. And I think a big part of that is he doesn't do this anymore. He does scripted comedy, Mm -hmm. and his scripted comedy has soured my memory. (laughs) Um, So I kind of wanted to go back and revisit it. So I've been completely like binging uh, the old Ali G show just to get it watched in time for this record so I can go away and watch Borat and Bruno, which is what I'm more interested in getting to, really. But but I no, I agree. It's it's so funny. And for me, that sweet spot is, weirdly enough, the first season when he went off to America. I think that's a touch above everything else. Uh, the subsequent season feels like they're losing a bit of energy, a bit of creative energy. Compared to the British stuff, it just feels so much more confident. And yeah. you do gain a lot by going to America, because you do just get bigger reactions for the most part in in the uk your reactions are going to be one of polite kind of oh dear oh (laughs) um stuffy old politician who's really unhappy about everything kind of going so there was the 11 o'clock show it was ali g that spun off into its own thing but as we say he was too much of a household name so he couldn't do it anymore so like i say we had these 
monologues, little skits that were pre uh, done in front of an audience. We had interviews with celebrities who were in on the gag. There were musical performances from celebrities who were in on the gag. Yeah. And then occasionally they would throw away to, like you say, these pre-recorded sequences. And with a few exceptions, they are almost entirely Ali G going abroad because people don't know who he is, like yeah. you say. Or featuring Borat, they added in a new character who could still go around harassing people in the UK <laughs> because people yeah. didn't know who he was. And I say new character, I mean, I don't want to get too ahead of Borat because next week, but Borat was actually, I think Borat might even predate Ali G. He was one of his earlier characters he was doing on the Paramount comedy stuff, apparently, and then he got heavily reworked and turned into Borat as we know him. Yeah. But yeah, and uh, you know, it was very much built as a kind of right. We want to get a bit of this sort of prank going out and about comedy stuff in here, but we're going to have to pad it because we can't possibly do a full show of that anymore. But to be honest with you, like, I watched it. I've watched most of that just the last couple of days, and I quite enjoyed it. I, I, I still worked for me, and even the scripted stuff, the monologues and stuff, it worked. I don't know if I yeah. d- would want another series of that, but like in the small doses you got it in, they did song and dance numbers. It always felt quite silly and fun. Yeah, I, I agree. It's a good show. I think the thing with Baron Cohen is when he's doing his thing, his hidden camera, not hidden camera, his, his comedy prank stuff, I think that is, you know, that approaches levels that are completely sublime. Yeah. When it's at its best. It is, like, some of the finest comedy you'll find out there. It's intelligent, it's funny, it's satirical, it says something. And I think when you get into scripted territory, it's still kind of funny, but it goes from being highbrow, legitimate art to, like, the lowest of the lowbrow comedy <laughs> like you could possibly find. It just becomes a load of knob gags, basically. Yeah. And with that very clever segue you just did, shall we talk about Ali G in the <laughs> house? Well, yeah, I mean, basically that's it. So, you, you know, peppered into that Ali G show, a bit of lowbrow nonsense works. It's fine. And, and I should add, you know, it, it's also world building as well. I think that sort of does a lot for it. But then... Yeah. You know, yeah, they got one series of that Ali G show out. I think they then realized, well, we can't really do any more of this because the whole thing's going to have to be in America and who's going to pay for that? And uh, everyone knows who Borat is now and blah, 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 blah. So instead, they just went full in cash cow. Let's do an Ali G movie. R- Ali G, the, the character and what he does, is cheap. You need a camera and a director and, like, a, maybe, you know, just go out there and film something documentary style. Because you are essentially shooting documentaries to what it is, so much cheaper than doing a, a proper film. So it's interesting yeah. that they chose to go down the scripted film format. Yeah, I, 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 I do find it interesting, and I, I suppose you know, on one hand, it's very easy with the hindsight of Borat. I mean, again, I don't want to get ahead of next week too much here, so I'm gonna yeah. really pull my punches with what I want to say, but. I mean, look, basically, Borat pretty much invented a new genre of cinema. That hadn't been done before. So I think, really, people just didn't think, oh, we can do a kind of documentary feature film and people will go to it. I think that's really all it comes down to. Having said that, I, I remember before Borat came out just being like, they should just do what they ultimately did with Borat. So, you know, it probably just wasn't presented as a viable option. And and, and I wouldn't be surprised if Sasha Baron Cohen himself maybe thought, there's a real expiration date on what I'm doing, so I need to write something and transition into just being a, a comedy actor, a writer. Well, I, I've just looked it up. Um, Jackass the movie was 2002 as well. So I was just trying to think of like, you know, that is essentially, you know, just going out there and filming stuff. Can you make a film of that? It's a TV show. And they did. You know, it was a big success. Um, So, yeah, I guess they weren't doing that before. I remember when that came out, everyone was like, what? It's just, yeah. is there a story? No, no, it's just Jack. Oh, okay. Mm. I, like, that was a bit of a hard sell for people at the time, I think. It was quite an odd concept then. Yeah. So. But also, as we mentioned with the show, Ali G was too well known. What are you going to do? Go out and film? What are you going to film? Well, I, you know, they they could have they could have easily done Ali G goes to America, yeah, and that's the whole movie. Uh, but they didn't. They did Ali G in the house, 
in the House of Commons, I guess, um, where Ali G, through a series of coincidences, becomes an MP. I think I think we're going to be talking about how this stuff has aged a bit, but I just want to like start off with um, the most <laughs> obvious weird bit of aging is just it, it joins. It's one of many many sort of political satires <laughs> that. Basically, you see uh, a moron being um, elected or or embraced by the world of politics, where they perhaps shouldn't be. That now takes on a slightly different uh, reading in a post-Trump <laughs> era. Um, and I, I don't think they're attempting to make any great political satire with this film. So it's just kind of, but it's very much a, a take on a riff on the producers. The idea is these two conniving politicians want to get Ali G in on the guise of him appealing to the youth vote, yeah. but sort of thinking, no, we'll get the worst the worst guy we can, and it'll completely destroy our party from the inside. Ha 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 ha, the evil plan. The idea is it's the deputy prime minister, he's trying to embarrass the prime minister so that he can take over. That's basically the, the idea. Yeah. Well, in fact, the the original point is to make him lose the seat. So he just picks a deliberately bad candidate. Again, he's trying to embarrass the prime minister by losing a by-election. Um, and then they accidentally wins the seat. So then he encourages him because if they oh, we can make him part of the government and then it'll become more and more embarrassing. But Ali G just keeps having success after success through a series of comic events. With this fictionalised, well, st- scripted version of Ali G, we see much more of him. We see him in his home environment and everything. Um, I mean, why is it so bad? I guess is the, is the question. Well, how? Why? Because the concept could certainly have been done better. I've I've spoken on this podcast before about the cliche of um, how movies based on pre-established comedy characters always open on them having a dream. Yeah, which is like a big, you know, over overly elaborate action sequence usually. Like, hey, look, we're doing a movie, but then it's all a dream. Mm. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it, I think that it just speaks to it. There's no, there is nothing resembling an original idea in this film. <laughs> Anything intelligent or clever or yeah. it's it's all just lazy knob jokes and fart jokes. <laughs> yeah. I think it's probably the best example of lazy knob jokes you'll get. It's very well performed. It's funnier than, for example, Sex Lives of the Potato Men. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know. It's I don't. Is it well performed? <laughs> I don't know if that's true. You've got an endearing comedy character, uh, ver- you know, performed by someone who's very comfortable playing him. I think Sasha Baron Cohen is a very good actor. Well, Even I don't know if he is. You might not see much of it. Yeah, I don't know <laughs> you, if he is. You might not see much of it here. But the thing is, I think with this, the the character of Ali G we get in this film is different to the character of Ali G that has been previously established. Yeah, that is true. That is and true. Uh, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work in the same way. And also, it, the tone of comedy is completely different to what we've seen before as well. So who yeah. is it serving? Like, what is it for? Well, this is it. You know, uh, we, we amazingly haven't got into it yet, but the the... The basic concept of Ali G is that he is this he's like a white kid trying to quote unquote be black. That that's sort of the gist of it. And I there's hints that he's perhaps from certainly in the film you see he's from a middle class background. Um you don't really get any of that in the T V series, but but the joke was partly about, you know, making fun of people for cultural appropriation, I suppose, is what you'd call it. So, I mean, one of my big notes, really, on that note, is that there is a... I I don't think anyone really thought about it at the time, but certainly watching it now, it's hard to overlook the lack of diversity in this film. (laughs) It's so white, and it shouldn't be. You know, this film should be about Ali G, like, meeting a black guy who doesn't like what you I don't know it, like it just feels like there should be black characters in this film who either Ali's mates who he's trying to copy and be like or 
like an enemy who doesn't like that he's i don't know it just it's it seems like such a but this this is that's it right the, i think my problem with this is compared to the character that we've seen previously is that what we saw of Ali G before i didn't get that he is a middle class kid playing this thing and i think that might have been the original concept but it just doesn't come across yeah. what i got was that this is a this young man who it is like that and you can argue whatever cultural reasons he's taken on certain things but ultimately yeah. when he's talking about dealing drugs and stuff it's legit he does do that sort yeah. of stuff oh completely and he may exaggerate it and he may be uh, you know ultimately a bit sadder than he is but he's like still a kid that is kind of knocking about the streets but now with the film they very much make he's a middle class kid playing this thing and actually the str- you know the the hood is is stains and and obviously that's a joke that is that is from stains that's not really the hood but ultimately that doesn't come across but in the film they make it very apparent and it just sort of lose the, the character loses any kind of dignity i suppose for a weird word yeah. to use for well, it well i know i know what you mean ali g talks about you know his mate dave a lot on the show yeah. And he talks about his Julie, uh, his girlfriend. And they're these kind of mythical characters who I never really wanted to see them. I I don't know. And and then you do see them in the film. You meet them and they're just completely underwhelming. Oh, it's Tony (laughs) Way. Great. Okay. And I I think that's another problem with this is that Ali G, I think, is presented as a, a comedic character within the real world, typically. Everyone else is normal, but he's ridiculous. But in this film, very clearly, everyone from Staines, his little quote-unquote ghetto, is a ridiculous character. Yeah. Which kind of takes away from it. One of the big gags in the film is that this MP sucked off a horse. So <laughs> it's kind of just set in a in a stupid <laughs> comedy world, and it just doesn't really... It felt like nobody who had been involved with Ali G made this film. Mm. But that's not the case. This was yeah. all the same people. Or at least, you know, yeah. it was, you know, Sasha Baron Cohen obviously is shepherding the whole thing through. And the the guy who co wrote it is someone who's been with Cohen like throughout his entire career, still works with him. Someone called Dan Mazza. Is that how it, Yeah, Dan yeah, Mazza? yeah, yeah. And it seems like he worked on the eleven o'clock show as well. It's, there's a consistent through line here, but why have they not managed to keep it consistent? <laughs> well, I, I think it's just because it's a very different skill set. You know, what what Sasha Baron Cohen does is a very specific skill set of going out and improvising comedy based on what you have around you, trying to dupe people, not not corpsing and giving it all away, coercing people into behaving a certain way. That's a very specific thing he's doing, Mm. and nothing about that really suggests that it equates to being a good writer or actor. Well, all right, but you know, I I think Sasha Baron Cohen's a good actor. I think he's a perfectly good actor. He seems to be much better in things that he's not creatively involved with. Well, so you prefer you preferred Ali G in the uh, in the Madonna music music video. <laughs> Is you Madonna? Are you my driver? Is you Madonna? Your Babylons look less big than they do on the telly, but I still definitely would. You wish. I do actually. <laughs> As opposed to the music video he did with Shaggy for Mijuli. Well, do you want to talk about a few more specific elements of the film? For example, Martin Freeman. Weird, weirdly, Martin Freeman's best film. <laughs> Strangely. <laughs> That's not true. Uh, Shaun of the Dead, of course. Yeah. <laughs> the worst Martin Freeman performance I've ever seen. Um, yeah, yeah. No, no, actually, no, I've definitely... <laughs> You've seen Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? I feel like I've seen Martin Freeman really struggle his way through an accent, <laughs> and it ruins everything. 
But all I can think of where he does an accent is um, Fargo, and he's still pretty good in it, even though the accent's terrible. <laughs> oh, maybe I'm thinking of Black Panther. Oh, yeah. Not Black Panther, but the Civil War, wherever he first appeared in Marvel, yeah, and he's maybe. doing a really bad American accent. You're like, oh. Um, Martin Freeman's alright. He's got some good films under his belt. Oh, yeah, yeah, but this one is not one of them. No, he he plays a, an incredibly heightened comedy character in this. It's just kind of embarrassing. Yeah, I mean, it kind of works in the context of the film. But... Well, that's it. It fits in with the ex- extreme comedy nature of the film, but the film's not good either. So it's not. And he's kind of doing a weird voice the whole way. That's just like, what are you doing, man? He's, I don't know. I don't even. Hey, yo, yo, Jesus, the LAPD man. Yeah, and. <laughs> You are from bad mouth, man. I is feeling it. Yeah, I'm you rocking it? I'm feeling it. I'm checking it. I'm doing it. I'm feeling it. I'm kissing it. I'm checking it. Nice. Because, like, I guess the obvious thing would have been to have him do a kind of Ali G impression, but then <laughs> I don't know. It's 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 his own thing, if nothing else. Yeah, it doesn't really make any sense. The costumes weird. It's it's Martin Freeman operating at Tony Way's level. <laughs> Tony Way, of course, being the actor who plays the other friend. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, who sort of, but then his thing is he doesn't really talk until kind of near the end where they, they set it up as if they're going to make a joke out of it and then they don't, they don't really do it. Yeah. Jane Silent Bob, isn't it? Yeah. You've, you've cracked the code. <laughs> but yeah, the friends are just there for props, really, as someone for him to talk at to deliver some exposition. Yeah, and that's perhaps the part of the problem is that the plot never really sets on fire. It's just a series of kind of nonsense things. It's a very, very lethargic film. Um, yeah. It is just this limp kind of bumbling from one sketch into another. Here's the bit where Ali G meets a kid in front of, as part of being a politician, and he's been bullied, and then he bullies him more because he's fat. He's at a school and they're going, oh, we're doing this anti-bullying campaign. A fat kid walks up. Well, a normal kid with an obvious fat suit on walks up. I was going to say, he's not even fat. They couldn't even find a fat kid. He's like (laughs) got a normal face and then his body just looks like he's got a pillow stuffed on his shirt. (laughs) And Ali G, and so they go, oh, this kid was used to be bullied and now he's much better. And he basically just goes, oh, you're so fat, eh, fatty, bum, bum. And that's the joke. Whereas... It would be so much better, and in keeping with the LG character, if... If they'd done it for real, and he'd actually gone to a school and met a fat kid <laughs> and just been like, Oi, fatty bum bum! And then, like, <laughs> made a real kid cry. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would have been good. Yeah, even as a scripted thing. But if he goes up to him and, and he's like, oh, yeah, and you were bullied for being fat, and he was like, what? No, I got bullied because I'm ginger or whatever. He's like, oh, yeah, you're fat and ginger, aren't you? Do you know what I mean? Like, something a little bit more subtle than that, that he's still insulting him. Like, the, there was subtlety to Ali G. There's no subtlety to this film. Yeah. I, I must say, I, I'm surprised, Alan, that you're coming in so negative here, because <laughs> I remember talking to you at university about this film, and you, you really, I think you got on a horse and, like, defended it against everyone else. You were like, well, I think it's probably the funniest film I can name. What? <laughs> I, did, I did not say that. You were saying it was, like, one of your favourite, like, films in terms of how funny it was. I don't know about that. I mean, I'll... I don't think we've ever really gotten into the area of guilty pleasure (laughs) beyond Calvin on this podcast. (laughs) Obviously, like, everything Calvin likes is just guilty pleasure. I don't think I've ever really spoken about a film where I really like it and I know I shouldn't. But I I don't know, this, this... this is something of a guilty pleasure for me, this movie. Because it ob- objectively, it's bad. Yeah. And, like, it's a piss, piss poor use of Ali G and, you know, the talent involved. It, it's just, you know, it is it is just, like, shite. It is crass, lazy shite. But <laughs> I've watched this film more than I've watched most films at this point. <laughs> And you know, I don't, I don't dislike it. I can't help but kind of just sort of go. Oh, he, he said the, he said the MP sucked off a horse, and he did. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best bit in the film. 
I, I I will say like the the set dressing, you know, like the the music in this film is great, or at least it helps build a, a world around Ali G and his character really nicely. I don't think and it's a well made the... film though. No, I don't at all. The, like it's not well edited or filmed or anything. You know, it's just very mediocre. And I love Ali G, and so there's a lot of goodwill that gets spent every time I watch this film. <laughs> <laughs> but it does do a lot to carry me through it. And I I do like Sasha Baron Cohen as an actor right, and a performer. I think he does do a good job playing Ali G. I switched my brain off and it was still below me. <laughs> oh, it's, it's below me? <laughs> because, and I, you know, I, I can appreciate a shit comedy, you know that. It's like if I go to a pub and it's not my kind of pub, but it's a really hot day and I'm thirsty and there's nothing on the tap and I think, fuck it, I'm going to have a pint of Foster's. <laughs> like in 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 the right context i might drink that fosters and go you know what this terrible shitty beer serves its purpose as a cheap drink in this pub on a hot day to quench my thirst i'm enjoying this and that's what ali g in the house is it's objective shit <laughs> that serves its place and you know it's a completely wasted opportunity it could have been so much more than it is but I I I don't dislike it. I I I I give it an incredibly generous six out of ten. <laughs> and if I was being objective, I think it's more of a five. <laughs> but I'm giving it a six. That's that's you know. I it's funny what you said earlier about me defending this film in the past, which I have no memory of, but. It does strike me as your sense of humour. That's the thing. It really does strike me as the kind of thing you would just... Because you love that film Black Ball with um... <laughs> Dennis Penis. <laughs> Poor Kay, yeah. So, I, I, I guess the difference is Vince Vaughn turns up halfway Vince through Vaughn's that film. Vince Vaughn's in that, yeah. If Vince Vaughn turned up halfway through Ali G in the house, you would love it. <laughs> Um... But yeah, this is the thing. You you are well known, I think, not so much on this podcast, I'm sure our audience aren't as familiar, but certainly within our social circles, you are known for your soft spot that you have towards like truly diabolically <laughs> shit comedy films. I think I came away from it going, This was a betrayal of a very good character and they fucked it up. Yeah. It's like it should have been so much better, and on that basis, it's it's more unforgivable. Uh, and I also think it's just not that funny to rate it. And, and like I said, it was interesting. You said I've defended this film in the past, which I don't know, don't recall. But my my rating that I had on my IMDb was seven out of ten. Yeah, see, which it sounds like yeah, it was fine, whatever, shit comedy, right? That's I mean, how long has it been since I watched this film? Fifteen years? I don't know, something like that. I watched it again. I gave it a 3 out of 10. And maybe it just appeals to you more when you're 18 years old, which is what I was when it came out. <laughs> Perhaps that is part of it. I don't know. I, I was 12 when it came out. Yeah, that's why you think it's funny. Well, I don't think it's funny. That's the thing. I don't... <laughs> and if anything, I thought less of it when I was younger. I think I've done the opposite to you, Alan. I think this is what's happened, right? When I first watched this film, I thought, wow, what a load of shit. What a letdown. And I didn't like it. And I think I've come round to it not actually being that terrible. When you take it as it's presented, rather than with all the context behind it. And I think you've done the opposite thing. I think you kind of were initially there, but now you've started to take the context into account, and that's made you not like it. Maybe. Uh, well, um, did you know it? I noticed in the credits it says special thanks to Richard Curtis. Oh, God. What do you think that's about? I think he's a bit of secret script doctoring. No, I imagine he sent a, an email off or made a phone call to help them get some money. Mm. I bet you. Did Ali G ever turn up at Comet Relief, Red Nose Day? Ooh. It seems. Almost impossible that he didn't. Must have done. <laughs> yeah. Must have done. Hear me now. You was probably thinking, why is I doing comic relief? Well, me only agreed to do it because me thought we was going to get a free trip to meet me brothers in Africa. <laughs> and while me was there, maybe score some Botswana and homegrown. <laughs> so my guess is Ali G did Red Nose Day. Sasha Baron Cohen went, 
all right, but can you give me the email for the head of working title films, please? <laughs> I want to send them a script. <laughs> and Richard Curtis went, yeah, fair, fair trade. <laughs> uh, okay, so... I mean, the, the, the film the film was a... a it was certainly a critical failure. Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't think it went down well with the general public either. It wasn't a real, like, all oh, critics are so stuffy. I think it was, you know, known as a kind of trashy kind of crap film. Do you know what else is interesting, though? Given that they went and did the show in America and that was gaining a bit of traction over there. This is a very British film. Like, it's very rooted in British culture. Well, this is before they took the show to America. I mean, that's it? what I was leading into. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a very, very British film. I bet it's difficult to get it in other countries. And I think it really kind of soured the public on Ali G. I think this was the final nail in the coffin of Ali G after, you know, Ali G ringtones pe- being downloaded onto people's Nokia phones in the early noughts. Do you know what? I just, I, earlier, I didn't actually say it, but I was going to, when I was trying to explain how big Ali G was, I was going to compare him to Crazy Frog. <laughs> it was like, yeah. everyone knew it was. <laughs> it's just, uh, yeah. But, I mean, you've probably got to explain what Crazy Frog was for <laughs> a certain age. Should I explain what ringtones are? Because <laughs> don't, you don't get them anymore. Well, yeah, well, if we just have a quick look at his career, we're going to jump over Borat and Bruno, basically, because we're going to deal with those next week. But, you know, he 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 did Madagascar. He was voicing that. So that's, you know, been a nice gig for him every couple of years. Um, and, you know, he'd obviously gained a reputation. He was doing stuff in Will Ferrell movies. Uh, uh, and then he was in Sweeney Todd uh, as, a, as a main character major character and so he was doing stuff he was obviously he was lined up to play freddie mercury for a long while which i think is probably 50 percent down to the similarity in their physical appearance just naturally but um you know also that he's a, a capable singer with a solid bit of acting range um i think if he had played freddie mercury it it would i don't think he's a good enough actor to have pulled it off frankly uh it might have been a really good impression and it it probably would have been a better film um (laughs) but i don't think it would have been a better performance i guess my point is you know he's done a few things but he hasn't done much in terms of as a, a jobbing actor he certainly could have done a lot more. He, he, but he seems to focus on kind of processing his own films, doing Bruno, doing Borat, doing The Dictator. I think he kind of has a, a passion project every few years. He kind of, you know, who is America? I, I think that was the better part of two years of work. And, you know, typically a TV series like that, an actor could go off to a TV show. It's not two years of their life, but... I think a show yeah. like that, you're 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 dealing with so much pre-production, so much development time. It's and I presume he's not. He's, yeah, it's not like just oh, where's my script here? I'll turn up. You know, he's yeah, he's the producer and and involved in everything as well, isn't he? So yeah, it's he's much more involved. And I think that goes the same for something like the Dictator. Even it's his project, isn't it? It's his thing. It's not just a script that we've sent. It's built around the character that he's created. I think it's a real shame that neither of us have watched The Spy, which is his most recent thing, which was a Netflix drama. I think fairly well received from what I am. He is the lead in it and he is doing straight acting. Mm. And I think it's based on a real life guy who was a spy for the Israeli armed forces or something, but... I'm going to watch an episode of that for next week. I'll watch at least the first episode and uh, just so I can get a sense of him doing non-comedy acting, I guess. So can we move to The Dictator? Because chronologically speaking, jumping over Borat and Bruno, this was his next sort of lead, basically. Yeah, I I, um, I mean, this was his first big post Ali G, Borat, Bruno, I can't do this anymore, everyone knows who I am, <laughs> I can only do scripted stuff. This was his first big leap into the world of scripted comedy on an international American Hollywood scale. Yeah. And also we should add, I suppose, with Larry Charles, his new collaborator who directed the likes of Borat and Bruno, yeah. um, who also directed this film. So, um, you know, I, I think I I was quite 
hesitant about this film. I'd been burnt by Ali G in the house. <laughs> but I think enough about it kind of won me back over. Like, okay, I think maybe he's gonna he's gonna kind of learn his lessons and he's he's brought in a couple of other writers to help out. Maybe it'll actually be really funny. And the fact they're kind of doing a modern take on the great dictator, this Chapman mm. film that I I love, I think a lot of it means maybe he is going after legitimate satire and depth and meaning, which I mean, by all accounts, he was. Um, <laughs> and then I remember, Alan, we went to watch this film together at the cinema back uh, in London when we lived together back in the day. Oh, really? Yes, I I remember very clearly because I, I mean we've mentioned this on the podcast before, but I remember you were um, in and out of the screen because you were making lots of phone calls about a, a security gig. <laughs> That you were you were going to be a bouncer <laughs> for the Olympics. And it all fell um, so yeah, the dictator. I couldn't bring myself to rewatch it for this. Time, <laughs> which is, should tell you everything you need to know about my thoughts on this. I did rewatch it. I rewatched it today because I, I, I haven't seen it since then. That's a long time. It's eight years ago. So fair enough. I, and I knew I wasn't going to like it, but I thought, well, let me watch it properly and see what didn't work i mean i i my i remember not just disliking this film but full-on despising this film yeah yeah yeah. i hate the dictator i don't remember quite why i hate it other than i think i found it just so painfully like not just not funny but like anti-funny yeah it seems like in the dictator as well. They, it's kind of like they're 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 looking at these concepts and never find them. Like they, they set up early on that yeah he does whatever he wants, he kills people if he wants, he spends money on whatever he wants, but ultimately he's quite lonely. And they kind of play with that idea, and then and then the ending is him kind of finding this woman that he likes, but in the middle, the relationship between them is not realistic at all. It's not. It's not justified in any way, and so and so none of that works. The arc doesn't work. Yeah, and he doesn't change really as a character, and then until the kind of a very last minute switch where he's just like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I just remember finding it painful. I I can't remember seeing a film in the cinema that is that much of a painful experience in terms of not being funny. Hmm. I think it's the least funny film I've seen at the cinema. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I agree. I um, I've just found on Facebook. Um, I don't know if you remember, but back in 2012, I I did a load of Microsoft Paint drawings of <laughs> scenes from films that I oh, found yeah. funny. I was I was really entertaining myself for a week or two doing these shit scenes from films, uh, with captions on them. And, yeah, I remember. Uh, I think off the back of how how bad this film was, I went and did one for the dictator. Where I basically drew a picture of of the dictator, and then in the background I drew a pair of tits and a spunking knob, and then <laughs> there's a label that says George Bush and an arrow pointed to the knob, and then the dictator himself is saying this picture is better, more satirical, and contains more artistic merit than the piece of shit film. <laughs> and I'm I'm just I, I guess we'll have to post this up on our social media or something so people can see what I'm talking about, but. Um, <laughs> But it's interesting because I've just found there's like an essay in the comments about my opinion from the day after I watched it. So okay. would you like me to read this out as a yes, time capsule? If not, this might be bullshit. I haven't actually read it out yet. So I'm reading it out in real time here. Let's see. Uh, I saw it yesterday and I was shocked at how bad it was. I expected it to at least be like Ali G and the House, which was shit but enjoyable on a guilty pleasure level, <laughs> right? So that's that's pretty much uh, yeah. echoing this episode so far. I watched Jack and Jill the night before, and honestly, this is comparable. It really reminds me of The Love Guru because both have Ben Kingsley, <laughs> yeah, both are that. absolute shit. But this is probably a little bit worse. <laughs> None of the jokes work. It's all just shit shock humour without any substance to back it up. Some of it was actually just offensive. To me, I'm all for being offensive, but there has to be some sort of reason or justification for it, and this film has none of that. Plus, the characters are poorly defined, and the storyline is incredibly laboured every single step of the way. But yeah, the worst thing about it is that it's just so horrendously unfunny. Four people wrote it. Sasha Baron Cohen and the three geniuses that brought us the cat in the hat. This is their worst film. <laughs> Ouch. 
So, yeah, I mean, that, uh, it's amazing how little my views have changed in eight years. <laughs> yeah, and fair, fair comment, I think. I, I'm, I'm really, I'm quite impressed with how concisely I summed it up back then. But yeah, wow. Um, so I mean, yeah, I, I, off the back of that scathing takedown, I mean, my my rating for this film is two out of ten, and I hate it. I don't know if you have anything else to say, or if you want to give it a rating. Um, the only thing I give it a two out of ten as well, and the reason it got a two instead of a one uh, it was for the songs, because in it there's quite a few basically pop songs, well known songs. But done in a kind of, I guess it's supposed to be like a Wadian language. I don't know what language actually they've been translated to. Well, uh, that makes The Dictator our seventh worst film of all time on diminishing returns. <laughs> and 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 that's fair, fair you know. Yeah. <laughs> Seems a bit high to me. I um I I haven't seen Grimsby, but uh, I believe you have. I have, yeah. So do you want to tell me a bit about it? Yeah, it's 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 a nice eighty minutes. Um, which is what I'm looking for. I I do intend to watch it at some point. But it is on I Netflix. I still think. not. It was yeah, I I've it. just still not got around to it. It's that that far down my list of priorities now. After the dictator, it is. They do go for legitimate action stuff. It's directed by Louis Leterrier, who did all the uh, transporter. Yeah, I'm a fan of Louis Leterrier. I, I think um, I think he's very good at action action filmmaking. And I think it's it works on that level. It's got certain like James Bond spoof elements. Basically, the idea is that there's a a Bond type suave spy played by Mark Strong, and then his kind of long lost dickhead brother played by Sasha Baron Cohen comes along and kind of gets in his way, and they have to deal with each other and deal with their sort of issues from childhood as well. And it's a lot better handled than some of the stuff, but the 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 comedy level is still so poor. And so, yeah, lowbrow, I guess. And it's, yeah, it's just like, oh, look, um, at one point, Mark Strong character gets shot shot with poison in his cock and the other guy has to suck it out. <laughs> <laughs> at one For point, they get, they get <laughs> trapped. Sake. They get trapped, both of them, in an elephant's vagina. And then another elephant has sex with it. And so they have this big <laughs> elephant cock, like, f- jump- coming at them. And then they get covered in spunk, and it's absolutely <laughs> hilarious, as you can imagine. Yeah, I can't. I can't imagine. I can't imagine how you could even begin to visualize that in a film. <laughs> well, it's not well visualized. If you want to know, <laughs> and you know, it's Mark Strong's done some things in his time, but it's really, it's I don't know. There's a real lack of dignity about the whole thing. It's, it's sad to see. Really, it's not. It's not. Nice. <laughs> Oh god! For what it's worth, I gave it a five out of ten, so it's considerable step up. Wow, in yeah. Quality, but I think it's because it, like the action stuff generally works, and it, it kind of as a plot structure, it basically works. It's just the actual content is quite poor, weak. I will watch it at some point. We'll do a diminisode when I finally get around. Uh, to yeah, it. yeah, yeah. So yeah, going back to Ali G in the house, Baron Cohen's experiment into being a writer had kind of failed. <laughs> Very rightly so. They they managed to get some tapes of the Ali G show in front of HBO. Someone at HBO went, Oh, I see the potential in this. And that <laughs> leads us on to Ali G and Dai USI. Should we um yeah. should we save this for next week's episode or do you want to cover it now? I think we should sign off Ali G. Okay. Uh, Most places you look online now will refer to this as seasons two and three of that Ali G show. Yeah. But it really is its own thing. Um, it was always kind of sold as a separate series. Certainly in the UK, it's considered a completely different show, or at least it was until recently. It was Ali G and the USI. And it does have a different format. Yeah, well, that's it. That's why I really do think of it as a, as a different show, because it's just got a completely different format. It's gone of the audience sequences. You have a couple of monologues to camera introducing each bit from Ali G and Borat. It is just basically them going around America, doing their stuff in America, yeah. and you know they've really honed it. I I think it is some of the funniest stuff ever committed to film. You know, a- Ali G doing a a day ride along with the the cops. Yeah, yeah. Yo, Brinkman, is you good cop and I is bad cop? Well, you're who's the good cop? Who's the bad cop? No, it's not. And just trying to be a cop is just 
glorious. And and you know, it's it's fun because it's not some of it is exposing horrible bigotry and is funny on that level. But you know, some of it is just like Ali G being a prat and you know he's with this policeman who's taking him around and Ali G has to put a call out for these suspects. Three men. Yo, yeah. three men. One black male, one yeah, 20, white male. 2310, there's three men. One, one brother, one honky, and one <laughs> what's the S? Spanish. <laughs> one Spanish. And the second he says honky, you can watch the other the policeman with him like burst out laughing. <laughs> <laughs> crying with laughter and then he has to take him aside and give him a talk because you know he's in a, an official capacity but even then he's very like look it we refer to the person as a white male not as a honky why not a honky in the united states is not a nice term for a male for a white for a white person why not it's it's, it's like an ethnic slur ah for real it, but they say you can be a honky but you can still be young like a donkey possibly some characters like him come across really well you know yeah, and it's definitely in the context of it, these police are showing a TV presenter around like their training program. So it's not like they're trying to do it legit. They're having a bit of fun with it, and they know that he's kind of just doing what he's doing, even if they believe that he's the real person, you know. But yeah, yeah I like that sort of stuff. And uh... You know what a burglary is? For real, I've done a couple. Okay. It did make me think, actually, you know, when I was thinking about the Ali G in general... Because I was thinking, like, you know, sometimes the the person he's interviewing kind of becomes the butt of the joke and kind of they look foolish. But sometimes Ali G himself is the fool and he's the butt of the joke. And that's interesting, this balance. And that completes Cop 101 here at the Philadelphia Police Academy. How'd it go? What you think? Respect. Do you think I can make a good cop? Uh, probably not. But I realised, something you were saying earlier, I realised it's, he says stupid things. If they agree, they look stupid. And if they go, well, no, that's not quite right, they don't. And he becomes the stupid character. Well, to a point, um, sometimes they'll, you know, sometimes he'll say something stupid, but innocent. Yeah. If they kind of humour him or give him the time of day to kind of explain what's up with it, they come out of it really well, generally. Yeah. But if they, like, think what a fucking moron and get angry, they don't come across well at all. So, you know, Butrus Butrus Gali, for example, comes across incredibly well. Because, like, you know, it's this old man who doesn't have a clue what the hell Ali G's doing. <laughs> but Ali G's there, like, saying, so when you're in the UN, you know, what's the funniest language? When they go up there and they're like, ah ba da ba da and, and, and he's just there kind of going, ah, oh, look, I can't say that. I, you know, but smiling and laughing along. And then they get on to talking about swearing and blah, blah, blah. And then he says, like, how do you say shit in French? And Boutras Gali kind of laughs and then tells him he goes oh it's uh mad mad <laughs> and like teaches him how to spell it and like you know <laughs> the fact that he's like just being good natured about it and giving him the time of day means that he comes across like a really pleasant man mm. <laughs> whereas you know there are other people in the show who don't and to be fair most of the characters with ali g do come across relatively well um, I think it's more Borat and Bruno who expose the really yeah. unpleasant side of people. But yeah, I mean, tell you what, we'll save talking about Borat and Bruno on this show until yeah. next week. But um, So we'll kind of end this in the middle of that Ali G show. But yeah, um, yeah I mean, you know, just, just broadly speaking, I think Ali G and the USI seasons two and three of the show are phenomenal. I mean, we rate TV shows occasionally. Do you, do you want to give a rating to the... Um, I haven't really watched enough of it recently. I've been watching the odd clip here and there rather than the full episodes. So I, I okay. won't. But, uh... Well, I mean, just just not as like an official rating or anything, but just to kind of give people a sense of where I'm at with these. I'd give the British show, that Ali G show, I'd give that an 8 out of 10. Mm -hmm. Like solid, enjoyable stuff. But I would give Ali G and Day USI seasons two and three of this show uh, a ten out of ten. It's mm -hmm. it's about as good as you know what it's trying to be could possibly be, if that sentence makes sense. And then weirdly enough, and I've no idea why or how this works, but season two of Ali G in the USI is, from what I can gather, entirely HBO, no involvement from Channel Four. And so as a result, 
isn't available on DVD in the UK, <laughs> isn't available on 4OD. It's really odd. Like, there's there's so much Ali G that's, like, impossible to get hold of if you're American, because it's the earlier British stuff. And then there's, like, everything after a certain point becomes really hard to obtain if you're British. And I, I mean, I have season two on DVD, because I, you know, I was one of those knobs who had a multi-region DVD <laughs> player back in the day when DVDs were relevant and had to dig my old American DVD out <laughs> to watch it earlier today. But, yeah, I mean... I think it's a phenomenal piece of work. Um, Really good, satirical, funny comedy. You know, rare that you watch comedy that's so actually funny, like laugh out loud funny, I think. Yeah. They they obviously took two more stabs at turning it into a movie, but we're going to talk about that next week, whether or not it worked with Borat and Bruno. So, Yeah. yeah. Come back for that. Respect. Respect. Want to throw some catchphrases out there? I tell you what, though, <clears throat> the legacy Ali G. The legacy Ali G is for me is I can do that thing with, with the fingers. <laughs> you had to learn how to do that back in the late 90s. That was the rigueur. I'm trying to think what other things I realised I'd picked up. Occasionally I'll go, wicked, wicked, jungle is massive. And I realise, <laughs> like, oh, that's just that's just a song I heard in the Ali G movie. Is that okay? <laughs> I mean, Ali G is such a capsule of a time and place, isn't it? I mean, yeah, you know, I, I I think his Wikipedia entry refers to him as part of Chav culture, and I don't I don't think that's entirely accurate. I said I thought the same thing. I don't get Chav from that. I, that's not what I think of as Chav. But he isn't a yeah. Chav, is he? Because Chav suggests a degree of antisocial behaviour that Ali G doesn't really get into but i don't really know what you'd say you know he's i don't know what culture he is part of what subculture he belongs to mm. well it's um tim westwood isn't it that's that's all it is it's exactly 